Well, as Brian mentioned, we've been on this, uh, this journey, this, this, I don't know what you'd even call it. It's, it's like this epic journey of trying to walk through uh, the, <clears throat> the, one of the most difficult books in all of Scripture. Um, this week, I, I picked up a, a, a book to help me as we went through for Sunday school this morning, what is considered to be one of the most ridiculously crazy hard sections of the book. And, and the author of this book, uh, a man by the name of N.T. Wright, wrote a book called Revelation for Everyone. And, and if you're wanting to go deeper, I would recommend it's a, it's a great option uh, for you to go deeper. Uh, again, I just want to back up and say something that, that I've tried to say as often as possible as we begin through this series. There are 15 to 20 people in the world who have dedicated their entire professional life to understanding the book of Revelation. And the one thing that they all can agree on is that they can't agree on it. It is that difficult of a book, and it is written in such a way that is very hard for us to understand. And, and so, you know, in our, in our Sunday morning time and on our Wednesday evening time of, of smaller groups to discussions for this, uh, we're able to get really deep. But for, for our time here, what I wanted to take on was, was actually the section that is, that is probably the easiest to translate into a time of, of a sermon, uh, because so much of it requires conversation. Um, and so we're looking at the seven letters to the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3. And um, <clears throat> this morning, uh, uh, as, I, as I prepared kind of my, my, my final notes and my, my final thoughts as I was getting ready to get up here, uh, I, I thought it was just important for us to remember that we're talking about a book that was written to people who understood it. It was written to people that, that there was, there was a, a, a purpose for each and everything that was there, a purpose that has not translated the 2,000 years since the book was written. We are not first century Jews. And so to understand it at its deepest core um, is not completely possible. And so I wanted to remind you that, that what I'm here today to give you and what I've been here for the last few weeks is not to give you the end-all, be-all understanding of what this is but to try to give you some basic understandings and some basic life truths that will help us go from this point forward. Um, I'm not giving you information to make you a better arguer of someone who believes differently than you do, because that's not the point. But we're here to grow in knowledge, but knowledge has a purpose. Knowledge has the purpose of transformation, and God wants to transform us. And, and this whole book has been written, we, we talked about it in the Sunday school time this morning, the, the, the book has been written because God is battling for our souls. And he wants us. He wants us to be with him. So much so that he has, he has come halfway and when we didn't respond, he came halfway further. And when we didn't respond, he came halfway further than that. Because he just wants to be with us. He created us to love us. And he loves us just because he created us. And so we look today, um, this is kind of an overview of the whole series here, the message received, what is God wanting for us. But today we're going to look specifically at Thyatira. Thyatira. It's a really hard word to say. Uh, Thyatira is, is not a, 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 a city by that name anymore. It's Akirim is the name of it, and it's in northern Turkey, and it's inland. Um, if you see here, uh, the first here is Patmos. This is the island that that John wrote from when he was when he was uh, expelled off of the mainland uh, onto this this island. Um, and we've kind of started here in Ephesus to Smyrna to Pergamum, and here we are to Thyatira. And uh, <clears throat> uh, in this in this conversation in this in this book. We just want to kind of trace where we've been from. We've been from Ephesus, which was kind of a, a, a huge culture that was influenced by their politics and influenced by their entertainment. Uh, again, not very different from what you would say about uh, the United States here today and now. Um, the highest paid people in the United States are all in, in the entertainment industry of some type, whether they're movie characters or whether they're, they're sports people or something like that. Uh, the, we don't pay the most money to the people who are making the biggest impact on us. 
You know, if that were true, then, then, then people that play football for a living would be making about 30000 a year, and our teachers would be making about a million dollars a year. But we don't do that because our, our, our direction is backwards. Uh, and that's how we can identify with Ephesus. Ephesus was all about the entertainment. They had a theater that would seat 30,000 people. I mean, that's, that's equivalent to, to uh, I mean, that's bigger than uh, ULM's football stadium. You know, I mean, so, so understand, they, they valued entertainment. And, and they had the second largest library in the world at that time. And so they valued knowledge. But in the process, they missed faith. Uh, la, uh, two weeks ago, then, we looked at Smyrna. And Smyrna was a church that was being persecuted. Uh, people were literally being killed. There were martyrs that were coming out of this. Uh, uh, this is the place where... Uh, Polycarp, who was, uh, that's a very funny name, I realize, but uh, he was the first disciple of John. And he was martyred there in, in, uh, in Smyrna. And, and so there, wa- there were not words for Smyrna that, that said, hey, this is what's wrong where you're at. Because here's what we know, when people are fighting the right fight, when they're in the right battle, they're not, they're not worried about minuscule things. They weren't arguing about what type of music to sing in church. They weren't arguing about whether to sit on pews or chairs or what color carpet there was. They weren't worried about any of that. They were there fighting for their lives. And they were fighting for the souls of people who did not know who Jesus was. And that's what was going on in Smyrna. And then we ended up uh, last week in Pergamum, up here at the the northernmost point. Pergamum uh, was was a a city that was deeply influenced by polytheism. Um, And it was was no problem to add Jesus into the mix of people that we worshipped. No big deal. We just bring a little bit. And so you had from culture, you had from outside the church, all these competing ideas that just kind of watered down the faith. And so today, we come into, uh, we come into this, this fourth city, this uh, Thyatira, that, that, that it was different than that. Because unlike the previous cities, this was not a metropolis. This was not a large city with a large group of people. Uh, about 100 to 150,000 people at the largest that this city has ever been. And it was not a city with great affluence except one thing. They were big into trade. They were, they, they were planted directly on the northern trade route, and, and it was a very hilly area there, and so everything, everything that was traded in the world came through there. Today, today they are known for their textiles, and they are known for their olives and their olive oil. Um, that is produced in the greater countryside that has the ability now with motorized equipment, has the ability to come there for trade, but... In that day and era, that wasn't there. What they had was, they had the largest bronze guild in the world. They had uh, a lot of things going for them that were different, but the, primarily it was their trade. And so uh, we want to look real quick at just a couple of things. Because of their large bronze guild that was there, uh, Thyatira was the first place in the world to mint coins. And, and here are four coins that they minted. Uh, in each of these coins on the left, this is Apollo uh, Timaeus, which they just called Thyatira. That's where the city got its name from. And so, uh, so each time you see this character here on the left, this is, this is the local god who was the god of bronze. Uh, on the right, every time they made a, uh, a, a treaty, a truce, uh, a, a declaration of peace with another country, with another group of people, they minted a new coin for it. And so here you have Caesar. Here you have uh, Pallas Athena, which is a, another, another um, goddess that was over a, a particular uh, uh, country. I don't remember what it was now. Uh, anyway, then you have Amazon Smyrna, which uh, was the city Smyrna just south of here. This was, this was one of the goddesses of, of that, and Amazon was her name. Uh, and, and here you have Amazon Smyrna holding Caesar. So a lot of stuff that's going on on their coinage. So, so, but this is really interesting, and this is a part of the history uh, of this particular city. They were big into coins. And so... Uh, 
This is, this is part of the ruins there in, in Thyatira, and I apologize, the, uh, the picture is a little dark. We had a bulb that got burned last week in our projector, and so everything's a little bit shady today. Um, but this is it. But here's, here's the amazing thing. Uh, what, when you get into these ruins, you can't really see it very well, but this is the city right here. This is the, one of the smallest areas of archaeological digs in, in a, an ancient biblical city. Um, it is literally one little block in the middle of town, and, and it is called Archaeological Park. So it's just a small place that you can go, and I guess you can use uh, old columns as a monkey gym if you want to. I don't know. It's, just, it's a park that you can go, and you can see, and you can play, and you can, you can touch some of the ancient things. Uh, but that's uh, Thyatira. Um, so here's, here's the scripture. Let's just kind of walk through what, what the scripture has for us to say and see where it's going to take us for the day. It says, and to the angel of the church of Thyatira write, these things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and feet like fine brass. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. Because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols, and I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent from their deeds." I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your works. Now, to you I say, to, uh, to you I say, and to the rest of Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burdens, but hold fast what you have till I come. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels. And I also have received from my, as I also have received from my father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And so, as is much of Revelation, there's some weird things in here. And so I just, I wanted to kind of go through and just kind of address, you know, short list of questions that jump out as you read this. Some weird things. Jesus' description. He introduces himself as the son of God, as the, having eyes of fire and feet of fine brass. Miss um, Susan, can you back up to the picture that had the coins on there? I forgot to put that in afterwards. This one right here. Uh, thank you. Uh, this one right here, this coin, this is a smelting pot with fire. This is a bronze pot. This is Caesar, and this is the god of bronze. So when Jesus introduces himself and he says, I am the son of God, the, the, the emperor of Rome was always referred to as the son of God. So, so we're talking, Jesus is making an instant statement. He says, he says guys, you got to understand, the guy that I'm, that, that's giving you these words is not emperor, but I am the son of God. And I come, and I don't need a melting pot. I don't need a melting pot to, find, to, to, to get the purity out of the bronze because, because I am made of feet with finest bronze. And so when we talk about feet of fine bronze, we have to go back and look at some of the, some of the Old Testament prophets. Uh, Isaiah and Jeremiah both talk about there are, uh, there are statues that are being worshipped in their day and age, and they talk about these are statues, these are gods that have eyes but cannot see, that have ears but cannot hear, have feet but cannot move. 
We can see in, in Old Testament when, when we get to uh, the, the conversation of, of, of Daniel, Daniel is interpreting dreams for King Nebuchadnezzar, and King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream in which he has this grandiose vision of himself, but his feet are made of clay. And when Daniel interprets his dream for him, he says, he says, the understanding is that while you are very strong on so many levels, what you do not have is a firm foundation. And so when Jesus says that he has feet of fine brass, he, or fine bronze, he is talking to a people who worship bronze. And he says, I can stand on him. And my foundation is firm. And I am the son of God. Okay, Ms. Susan, can you take me back to my notes now? Thank you so much. Um, so, second, so that's the first question is, how, what is the importance of that? And the importance of that is just that. Jesus is making a declaration of who he is in comparison to who Caesar is or in comparison to, the, to, the, to Apollo, the god of Thyatira. Um, so next, who is Jezebel the prophetess? Now, Jezebel the prophetess is, is a very interesting thing because Jezebel is actually a throwback, a, a conversation backwards in time to the time of King Ahab. King Ahab marries a woman who is, her name is Jezebel, and, and the, the, the literal tan, translation of her name is Jeza is daughter of Baal. Now, Baal is a god who is talked about throughout the Bible. Uh, Baal is a god of... of um, of, of fertility for the soil, uh, and, and Baal has a female side, side accomplice to this. Her name is Asherah. Uh, Baal and Asherah, the, the way that the, Jezebel was deeply criticized for bringing Baal worship into the mainstream in Israel during the time of King Ahab. And here is, here is kind of an understanding of what happened, and I, I, I will apologize for the, the, the grotesqueness of what this is, but this was what was brought then. So every year in March, whenever it was time to plant the, the, the crops, the way that they, they would worship Baal was outside Jezebel being the chief prof, priestess of Baal, being the daughter of Baal, every year would have a great altar made, about 40 foot round, and this altar was built out in front of the, 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 the castle, if you will, the, the, the dwelling place of King Ahab and Jezebel. And on that, all of the priests and priestesses of Baal would come out for a five-day ceremony in which this altar was used for an orgy. The, 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 the priests and priestesses and all those who worship would come together and have sex on this great altar. And the point was to entice uh, uh, Baal and Asherah to have sex and to spread their, their, their fertility upon the land. So that, so that all, of, all of the land would be profitable, all of the, the, the olives, all of the, the trees would grow. Um, but there was, there was something else that happened at this that, that is very unnerving. So every year in this day and age, there would be women who would become pregnant during this worship time. Now that child was not for the family. That, fa that child was for the worship of Baal. And so the next year, you're, all of the women who had had children that came out of this would bring their three-month-old child, and there would be a large bronze bull that was built that was hollow. And underneath the belly of the bronze bull, they would light a large fire. And they would take these children, three-month-old children, and they would feed them through the mouth of the bull, slide down into the belly, and it would cook the children alive. Now, do you think God's got a problem with this? Shouldn't we all? So this, this prophetess, this woman who comes in the church, and she is a prophetess. She is a leader in the church. She is speaking into the leadership of the church, and she is bringing sexual immorality. Can we understand that a little bit better from Jezebel, right? Um, she is bringing in a worship to other idols. Can we see where this would be unfortunate for the church? Now, her name is not Jezebel. 
Um, he is rewriting cryptically because he doesn't want to necessarily call the woman out to all of the churches. He says, I have been there and I have given her the opportunity to repent, but she has not. So, so all of those that she has effect on, all of those that, that she has, has transformed over to her belief system, which is, which is a, a, a distortion of the truth. It, it is, is it a trading of the true gospel for what she says it is? Those are her children. And, and we, can, we can think it really, really harsh of Jesus to say this, but he says, I will kill her children with death. Now, as if, if you've been a part of any of the other conversations through our Sunday school, through our Wednesday night, uh, you will understand that there, is, there are a couple of different kinds of death. There is, there is the, the, the death that we go through when we turn our lives over to Christ and we go, this life is no longer my mind. This life is no longer my own. I am, I am experiencing the death of my will and I am turning over to the will of the Father. And through that, we represent that here in this church with, with baptism. Uh, we baptize people when they, when they come into the faith because in that time frame, that is a representation of us dying to self. And when we come out of the water, we are raised with Christ into a new understanding. And so we have that, that understanding of that's the first death. And if you, have, if you have undergone that death throughout Revelation, it talks about there is no other death to harm you. Because the second death is the death of this body. And, and I don't mourn the death of this body if I, if I live for Christ because, because I know that there is a heaven that waits for me. And so we, we don't mourn this death. And so this is not a, 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 like a... <laughs> This is not a statement that says, I'm going to boil your kids alive. This says, for those who follow Jezebel, there is a final death. And, and that is hell. You know, I don't have to do anything. Their, their choice to not follow, that, that, that does it for them. And, and then, it, then it turns, for those who have not defiled yourself. The next number, number four says, for those who haven't defiled, defiled themselves, I'm not going to burden you with more. You're standing up to injustice. And he actually starts with, he goes, your love is better today than it used to be. Now, that's a good thing. That's something that we should all strive for. I, I, I can remember that um, when I first became a Christian, there was this, this emotional draw to Christ. Um, I, I equate it to like when I first started dating Amy. Uh, when I first started dating my wife, when, when we first started dating, every time I jumped in my truck to drive to our house, there was this, you know, this, this ooey gooey feeling like, oh, I'm going to get to see her, you know. There was, that, there was that type of emotion, but there was that when I first started, when I first started in the relationship with Christ, there was this emotional like, oh, I can't wait to read more. Oh, I can't wait to pray more. I, oh, I can't wait to get to church and learn more. I, you know, all these kind of things. But then after time, it's like those emotions wear down, right? Now, in, in, when, I'm, when I'm dealing with couples, if I'm talking about like Amy and I, there was a transition in our, in our relationship where we went from this in love oh, to we went to true love. Like it's no, longer, it's no longer just this emotional thing, but there's a commitment level that's there. There's this more that is there, this deeper that is there, this, this more holistic thing that is there now. I have traded in this emotional high for this lifelong high. You know, and so, so the same is with Christ. What, when, when we get to this, and, and, and John is talking about this in this church, they have traded in this emotion, this, this purely emotional state of walking with Jesus. They have traded that in for something that is deeper than that. And they are now, their deeds, their actions, their beliefs, their core is stronger today than it was when they first came. And so what he's saying is, you've traded your in love for, for true love, and you are showing it to the community around me. And so for that, I have no more burdens to lay on you. You're doing what you're supposed to do. Keep that up. Keep looking deeper. But, but again, for those who are perverting, for those who are following the false teachings, for those who are giving in to what the, what the, the world would say is normal, but Jesus says is not, for you guys, we got problems. 
And so then we get to this, this, this next thing, um, ruling with, an, with a rod of iron. Uh, this is actually very, very interesting because, because John is quoting, um, he is quoting something out of the Psalms. Uh, and so I want to I want to look real quick at what he's quoting here because it's just a it's a single sentence paragraph, but it's not the only time he quotes in his book of Revelation this exact same passage. And so I'm going to read from seven to eleven, although the specific passage is verse nine. Psalm chapter two is titled "The Messiah's Triumph and Kingdom." And it says in 7, I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possessions. You, will, you, will, you shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Now, now here's the beautiful thing, and this is what is echoed in the book of Revelation from beginning to end, and that is, guys, I know this world is tough. Man, I know there are times that are so hard on you. I know that in this world you have to deal with broken relationships and losses and death and grief, and, and you've got to deal with, with consequences for choices you've made in your life. There's all these kind of things you've got to deal with here and now. But there's something coming. There, there's something that's really, really awesome out there. And, and at some point in time, all of these princes and principalities, all of these kings and kingdoms, they're going to pass away. And when that time comes, only my kingdom stands. And when only my kingdom stands in that kingdom, th there's no more fears. There's no more tears and heartaches. There's no more pain. There's no more hurt. There is only rejoicing because in that moment, you are in the presence of righteousness. You're in the presence of God Almighty who wants you to have the very best. And when that moment comes, you don't have to worry about all that stuff anymore. You don't have to worry about that pain and that hurt. You don't have to worry about how hard life has been because at that point in time, all those things that have distracted you, all that sin, all that worry, all that fear, guess what? That got burned up. Remember, he has eyes of fire. Those chaff, those things that cloud us from time to time, uh, when we talk about wheat, when we talk about uh, even, even the purification of bronze, we talk about heat being the thing that pulls away those impurities. If you're thrashing wheat and you light it on fire, like Brother Ray's been up there at the wheat harvest all week, when, when they get to the end of it, now we have mechanized things that will, that will separate the seed from the, from the leafage and, and the chaff and all that kind of stuff. In that day, there wasn't all the mechanization, and so they would, they would beat it out the best I could, and then at the end, they would take and let it dry up, and they would burn the leaves, and the leaves go away, because when the wind blows on you and you're burning something of wood, you know it just spreads all this ash out and what's left in the bottom is the pure wheat when you're when you're purifying bronze because that's what these people were doing you light a very hot fire and 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 then all of the impurities they boil to the top and you take a piece of metal and you scrape it across the top and all those impurities they fall off and what's left is pure and that's what Jesus has for us that's what Jesus wants for us. He wants us to be pure because he knows that he is pure. And when we get to heaven, we don't have to worry about all the junk that got burned up and pulled away. We're left with just him. Just us and him. An easy way to celebrate. So then we come to this morning star. This last piece, and this is probably one of the most spectacular parts of this scripture to me. Because the, the, the joy, the, the prize for finishing strong is that the, he will give us the morning star. Well, well, that doesn't mean a whole lot to us, does it? What's the morning star? Is that that last little speck of light before the daylight comes? What is that? What is the morning star? Revelation twenty two sixteen. 16. I, Jesus have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David 
and I am the bright and morning star. What is the gift of finishing well? This is the most intimate thing Jesus could give us. He gives us himself. That's how much he loves us. When it comes down to the end, when all is said and done, when everything is over, what Jesus wants for you and I is he wants to spend eternity with you. That's what he wants. So, so, so what do we learn from this? What do we learn from this whole deal? These are the questions. Will we remain pure to receive the ultimate intimacy from the Savior who desires us? That's what I hope we all answer is yes. But there is an alternative. Will we prostitute our hearts and souls out for today's pleasures? Because that's what's happening. That's, that's what we, we always seem to be fighting. What do we want today? And do we have the ability for delayed gratification? Do we have the ability to put off today for a better prize tomorrow? You know, there are so many things that pull us today. There are so many different ways that we can be, we can be twisted and turned and so many different ways that we can lose our focus because there are shiny things all around us. And when it comes down to us, we're all like that, like that, that, that really high-strung little dog that's like, ooh, squirrel. Ooh, shiny thing. You know, we, we do that so much. We are, by nature, attention deficit disorders. We are because we chase the shiniest things. We chase these little things down. But Jesus says, if you will have patience, if you will have this virtue of holding off, the ultimate prize is so much bigger. The ultimate prize is so much better. The ultimate prize is, I will do everything to meet you. The ultimate prize is, I, I will... I will chase you till my own death. And I'll beat that. And I will do it all because I love you. And so that is our challenge for today. Um, when we leave this place today, when we go out beyond these walls, what drives us? What draws us? What takes us to that next place? Are we going to stop and chase the shiny things? Or are we going to hold out for the greatest and most awesome prize that there is? Will we hold out for eternity sitting and talking with Jesus Christ? I'm going to close this with a prayer, and Brother Kenny's going to come up and share just a few community concerns with us. So pray with me. Father God, we are so thankful for the opportunity to be given this greatest prize. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be able to share heaven here and now on earth. To be able to, to talk to people and to show people that there is a better thing that is out there than what's right in front of us. And so God, we pray for strength. We pray for just enough vision for today so that we can see what you want for tomorrow. God, there's an old psalm. Will your words be a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path? God, may that, that, that lamp so close, giving us just enough light for the next step, may we always keep that lamp close to us. And that light, that beacon off in the distance, continuing to keep that at our true north so that we are walking in the right direction always. God, may we follow you not just for today, but for the rest of eternity. And not follow you out of some obligation or some contract for a future reward, but because we're feeling your presence in our lives each and every day. Father, may we engage you with our hearts, with our minds, with our souls, and with our bodies. And when we do that, may this culture, may this community, may our hearts forever be changed because of who you are. It is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who loved us enough to give us this crazy, weird, hard to understand, filled with love letter of revelation. May your spirit continuously be revealed in our hearts. Amen. Brother Kenny. This morning as we get ready to close, just remind you of Wednesday night services where we'll have an opportunity to come.
come and, and kind of just uh, gather together here in the middle and share and, and uh, talk a little bit about the message uh, from today and, and the Sunday school this morning. And uh, It's a great time to get together, a great time. I'm telling you, that's the quickest hour uh, in Sunday school and su uh, Sunday mornings, and it just flies by. I uh, encourage you to come and enjoy the last few weeks of, that, of this series and, and be a part of that. Uh, one youth camp is down. Uh, the 8th and ninth grade starts this week. I think we have a couple of campers going down to the 8th and ninth grade camp, and uh, they'll be leaving sometime, I think, in the morning. Uh, be praying for our youth camps uh, this week and then the next week. And then uh, uh, we will have senior high camp on July the 16th through the 20th. Uh, go ahead and mark your calendars for Sunday night, July the 22nd, here at 6 o'clock. Uh, the annual unity service will be here. And uh, shortly after that uh, service that night, uh, we will have a time to where it says youth bowl, but anybody can bowl. If you'd like to go and bowl, it's $6, and that includes your shoes, and that's for the whole evening from 8 till time they close. So I encourage you to come and participate in that if you'd like to and be a part of that. It's the one time every year when we have almost 300 people in the sanctuary here. So I encourage you to come and be a part of that uh, event. And then, uh, of course, the next week will be uh, Camp Pollock. Uh, and uh, there are Pastor Ray and, and them will be going. I'm not sure if anyone else is, but I encourage you to be a part of that. And then uh, right, af uh, right after that, uh, on Monday the 30th, I believe, it's the 30th, 29th or 30th, we will be uh, sharing at Grace Place. We'll be preparing a meal and serving it there. So go ahead and mark your calendars to be available for the last Monday of July as we will participate and uh, take care of Grace Place that week. Uh, normally we would close right now, but Pastor Ray has an announcement he'd like to talk about real quickly as we are going to gather together for a time of prayer. Church family, uh, just a few moments ago I got asked to come out uh, of the sanctuary and we have with us uh, grandparents, Brian and Janelle. They're on their way to St. Jude's. Their granddaughter, Lisa Bordelon, is 14. She's at St. Jude's with a real rare cancer. They're pretty emotionally straught about that, which you would understand. Very rare cancer, usually only attacks uh, elderly. And um, their daughter, the mother, Jill, is there at St. Jude's. And they've asked to come forward and be prayed for. So at this time, I'm going to ask Brian and Janelle if you will come forward. And uh, we'll just kneel at this altar here. Or I tell you what, you guys can, you can, you, you want you to sit here at the front seat. That would be better. We're not as young as we used to be, so we'll just sit here. Um, and if anybody that wants to come, the elders for sure, and anyone that wants to pray for them, for Jill and Pastor Trey and I will pray for them. Um, Pastor Trey, I'm going to let you anoint and then I'll, I'll pray for them. I've already read uh, the scripture with them in James chapter 5 that we're just following what the Bible says. Also in addition to that, uh, Brother Brian is facing cataract surgery too, so I want to pray for that as well. Join us in prayer. Father, I thank you now that as a body of Christ here at North Crossings, we join in the burden that Brian and Janelle have for their daughter, Lisa. I thank you, Lord, that you're able to go <laughs> beyond this place to anywhere around the world, anywhere in the universe. I pray now in the name of Jesus that you would send your Holy Spirit to fall upon that room in St. Jude's and that, Father, you would allow healing to take place. Give doctors wisdom, Lord, the chemo they choose, everything they do. But God, we know that all the treatment they do does not cause healing, but you give healing. Jesus, you're considered the greatest physician, the great physician. We acknowledge that, we honor that, we know all healing comes from you. So our hearts join these grandparents and their hurt, and we take upon that burden and we cast it to you right now. And Lord, we pray in the name of Jesus that you would allow healing to begin to fall upon Lisa Bordelon. And God, that you would bless her mother, Jill, and draw her close to you. 
that God, you would be with Brian and Janelle. And also, Lord, you'd be with Brian as he drives and as he comes back and as he has eye surgery next week, Lord. I pray you'd be with him. Lord, touch him. And Lord, as we read the scripture earlier today, I pray that you give them peace because the only peace that can possibly come now comes from you. Their burden is heavy, but God, will you tell us to cast it to you? So we cast it to you in the name of Jesus and all God's people said. Amen. At this, at this time, you're dismissed, and then the pastor's going to speak with, with them. And